great opportunity here to talk to some people who've got some really deep insights into what the future of work might look like. So I'll take uh, an opportunity, I suppose, to, to um, summarise where, where we got to during our sessions. And uh, I'm certainly not going to uh, cover everybody's area, but I just wanted to say, so one of the, the things that we could talk about goes back to those global trends and we saw digital and we saw distributed uh, digital, we saw social media in terms of the community and stakeholders where actually the power, customer power is in the hands of the community now as well and we've seen the ability of individuals and small communities to influence through social media campaigns and, and we've started to see the spread of those campaigns come across the borders like lock the gate in, in a negative way and positive uh, ones as well. So there's a, there's a range of aspects of, of digital and, and the community that uh, we're starting to see. So I, I think the other part about the internet of things was fascinating in terms of the drive for efficiency and, and the potential for a reduction in numbers, but we know that skilled people are going to be continue to be in demand. So um, without further ado, I'd open the floor to some questions to the panel. So. Hello Peter, how are you? So let, let, me, let me start off then. So we've, we've, we've got here um, the issue about autonomous operations. I, I can't help but think about what we've, what we've experienced over the last 24 hours here. And, and I'd open it up perhaps to Philip in the, in the conversation about the internet or Mark with regard to the driverless vehicles. You know, the operations of, of our businesses, when we get so heavily tied into digital into the future, whether it be in remote vehicles, underground, what are, what are the perspectives of risk that are associated with that with some of the catastrophic failures that we see? So, anybody feel like uh, having a, look, a, a crack at that? Yeah, look, I guess um, we, we, when we're designing systems, risk is, is a big consideration for, for everything you design, and it's got to be part of your engineering strategy. Um, I, I was sort of expecting a question to come up about security, for example, uh, cyber security within data, when you start putting information in the clouds, for example, that, that's, a, that's a fairly uh, large risk. Um, but. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to trying to isolate systems and have redundancy built into your systems. So um, we, we try and separate information to production systems, for example. Um, you don't want to be having um, information perhaps sitting in the cloud where people can come back and start operating your plant. Um, we want to separate information to, to control. Um, and certainly with cyber security, uh, cyber security is a, is a large a very big issue at the moment and I think we mentioned the, the issue of uh, the, the driverless car got hacked uh, I think the last 24 hours um, but um, it, it's about good design it's about being smart uh, and certainly from I guess a Honeywell perspective uh, we are now building cyber security right into our base level products so it's not about having a, a system and then putting security on top of it we're actually building it inside the components um, to, to ensure that uh, it's safe. Um, I hope that gives you a little bit yeah. of perspective. Yeah. I guess the, uh, the, the idea in, in the industry, production is important um, and it's not only about the aspects associated with you know, personal risk but it's also about risk to operations and those sorts of things. So um, I think that's given us some insights as far as that's concerned. But maybe in terms of that risk to operations, is that something, Vinay, that you're, you address in the sense of the ongoing maintenance and the continued operation of, of activities, but you still need, you still need a, uh, an internet to get that to happen? Yeah, so cyber security is a big issue. We have been going for big oil and gas contracts, same thing there. Cyber security is an issue, but we are attacking in, 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 in ways as well that, that meets the requirements of the cyber security policy that, that these companies have. Um, in terms of uh, machine health monitoring and diagnostics and so on, 
because we are not operating anything from the cloud, it's, it's a different proposition altogether. So the risks are a lot less uh, compared to real operations. You say so. You're talking about this weather event we had and, and its effect on mobility. The reality is that the electrification of mobility is going to continue. Um, the forecast for electric vehicles and therefore the reliance on the grid is going to get great. Um, and the uh, and with what's going on with diesels, we're finding our manufacturers are cranking up their investment in electric vehicles at the expense of diesel vehicles because they deliver the same torque characteristics. And I think in Europe we'll start to see that cross between the diesels drop off and electric vehicles uh, continue to take over where they work, including uh, light, uh, light commercials up to heavy commercials. So if you're in industry, okay, there's a lot of copper going around there, but the reality is that the risk comes when once you start relying on the electrification of your, all of your assets, that you do have a risk when you have power outages. The flip side of that is the, uh, the role that electric vehicles might start to play in complementing the grid for peak uh, delivery with, with smart metering, smart charging, and putting back into the grid. So, grid. so there's going to be a lot of disruptors in the future to a lot of a lot of uh, markets, including, as I said, cars could disrupt the electrical electric electricity distribution models as well. Mm. Mm. So, so, Mark, on that, you didn't sort of mention in, uh, charging point stuff like foreign correspondent the other night showing Oslo in Norway. We were doing that uh, on foreign correspondent. Was that about domestic charge points? Yes, charging points. Look, charging points, domestic or public tra uh, charging points, really are, they'll become a legacy issue. They, they exist now because of the product of range. Right. Now, you've got Tesla that's got 400 uh, kilometre range now. That doesn't need public infrastructure because most of the people will be able to drive it like they do with the car and charge at uh, other, you know, wherever the destination is, etc. Where you've got vehicles that still only got 100 kilometre ranges, that's where you need public infrastructure because people want to have this range anxiety that they're going to you know, not have a place to uh, charge. So an example of that is that we've been working with the state government on this project. It started off as an uh, electric highway for Kangaroo Island. Kangaroo Island has a fairly good uh, electric infrastructure there. They've got uh, electric vehicle, hire vehicles at the airport and they're charged from solar. But the problem was getting them from Adelaide to people who wanted to have electric vehicles to go from Adelaide to to uh, uh, Cape Jarvis, we've worked with them and there will be a public infrastructure put in, in fact, across the pluria, partly government, partly private enterprise. But the issue is you don't want to invest a whole lot of uh, money into that because most of, the, most of the money is actually in the civil works, you know, running power through footpaths to, to uh, poles and things like that. They're looking at, at cheaper, simpler systems where you actually run the charge points down the poles so as the infrastructure is no longer needed, you haven't got this big investment you have to pull back out. We're, we're approaching the whole idea of uh, locomotion from a different angle. And this is uh, using hydrogen as a fuel. Um, we're developing a system. Uh, someone compared the uh, energy density of the, the lithium-ion battery of which the Tesla car is based on as being about 170 watt hours per kilogram a weight of the of the battery we would be looking at uh, somewhere around 8,500 watt hours per kilogram and when you charge your car with uh, our, hydrogen, our method of hydrogen storage it is possible that you don't load for another seven or eight months. This is in a fuel cell. Yeah. Yeah. So th these are the these are the technologies we've been working on since 2002, without any support from state or federal government. Yeah. And um, when you work on the hydrogen technology, you need to look at three things. One to produce hydrogen cheaper than the conventional method, pure hydrogen. Yeah. And then you need storage, yeah. which is what we're working on. And the third leg is once you get the hydrogen, you need to be able to convert it to electricity or mechanical energy. Yeah. And uh, we uh, have a patented uh, hydrogen fuel cell that's two to three times more efficient than existing conventional proton membrane fuel cells. 
So if you had a kilogram of hydrogen, if you use our fuel cell, you'll end up two to three times further than you, if you use the conventional fuel cell. So if you put all of these things together, you can then use um, our technologies together, say, with renewable energy, so that you can produce electricity cheaper than coal. That's our objective. And then you can use uh, hydrogen to fuel land vehicles, water vehicles, ships, submarines particularly, because a hydrogen submarine has only one moving part, so you can hardly hear it compared to a diesel or a, a nuclear submarine. Uh, I tried to convince the government about that in the last submarine thing, of course. They don't understand it, so just work right side. Some other nation will pick it up, and, uh, and our submarines will be second class compared to these hydrogen submarines. So that raises an interesting point, and I guess it's about a lot of it's about innovation and the uptake of new innovation and competing innovation. So we get, you know, it's the old uh, story, I think, isn't it, about VHS versus beta? Is it is it is it the best technology that that wins in innovation? This is the general question, or is it actually, you know, the one that gets the best marketing that, that wins? So electrical vehicles versus hydrogen based, in, you know, other innovations. Is there a yeah, Christine. I mean, there's another way of looking at it because, you know, the same thing is said about phones, you know, the Apple iPhone has got a worse phone you can have, but it's actually, they don't sell it as a phone. They sell it as a, an experience. So it's the difference between understanding that people actually want a service and they're often not that engaged with what the technology is and will actually accept suboptimal technology if you can package it right. And I think that's one of the challenges in this area of kind of te technology and innovation. Because if you look at the people who get the kind of the point of entry right, um, and the iPad, I mean, it's actually hard to imagine a world without iPads, or without kind of that kind of mobile, and very quickly it's become ubiquitous. And, and that was actually about selling an experience. And so for me, when I think and listen to a lot of this, and even the question of risk, it's actually, you know, from an engineering perspective, thinking about what you think is acceptable risk may or may not be what other people think in a broader sense. And so I think for cars, that sense of control, there's lots of psychological evidence around people experiencing a loss of control being highly traumatic. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, we actually constantly have our information taken and there's a whole lot of incursions that somehow has become normalised. So for, I think that there's a crossover point around understanding the technical aspects versus the, the user. And the other comment I'd make is, you know, I think there's this huge challenge for governments more generally around people being skilled enough internally to be able to keep up with the debate. Mm. And I often think of it in the environmental remediation that often the very kind of really good practices around environmental remediation no longer fit with the legislative requirements, which are kind of based on old ideas of what, you know, sustainable landforms look like or whatever. Yeah. So, anyway. Just Good, thank you. John, you had a question, yes. Yeah, I, went, I won't go down the hydrogen path because it's another seminar. It's such highly inflammable. Everyone remembers the blue. I mean, Tesla's got 48,000 lithium batteries in it for a reason, but it's produces a small amount of hydrogen. So, uh, it's a bigger discussion that the Japanese are well advanced on hydrogen exchange technology, that's why people started importing LNG in the 60s, right? So they take most of the, the hydrocarbons that go in there and, and, and take the hydrogen out of it. And they've got an environment where they can use hydrogen in the winter as well as the summer. So the heat exchange you can't turn on and off. So yeah, that's a different discussion, but I'll stay with Mark on uh, radar telephony and, and the storms that we get in Australia with uh, torrential rain, how is the, the set, how are the centres being developed? Because I was, when I was in California with Google, a decent rainstorm and the bloody car was off the road because you know, actually uh, the radar wasn't effective enough with the resolution that's necessary. So I'd like to actually see where that's gone. I've gone six months out of date, so I'd like to know where it's going. Yeah, it's still not much further. And yeah. the reality too is that there's simple sensors for things like that, but they still don't have very good sensors for a car to do it, decide whether that road has just got an inch of water on it yeah. or three feet of water. So they actually still can't even get those things. So that's why there's still a fair way. And the default currently is 
when the when the car doesn't know, it hands back to the driver. But so you know, and and most of the R and D in this area is in the behavioural sciences. Because if the car's going to give you a, a hospital ball <laughs> right, right at the time when it's about to go wrong, yeah. uh, nobody's going to buy them. So you know, that's kind of where it's at. So no, the very heavy, very heavy rains, especially on high-speed things like autobahn, they yeah. still can't, they still can't manage the misting issues completely. I, I just like to see them talk about it because when you find out about it, if you're you're suddenly excited about it and then you find out that it doesn't work in one condition then you lose trust about the whole yeah. innovation and it gets back to Christine's thing about trust and people that's what I found so I thought god this is going to be the future mm. and then I found this out and I'm like, oh my god I'm, I'm going away from that whole well study about something else the, the way they the, the way they're developing autonomous cars they're developing in the same way that you teach your kids to drive up and down the driveway until they've you know got used to the braking pedal round the block until they got used to turning once they're a bit better take them out a couple you know in the suburb all all in, in well-known and slow speed environments you gradually up it so what happens is autonomy will come with a high level of, of uh high level of confidence <coughs> in pedestrian precincts because the you know the, the rain is not such an issue for them yeah. And so you'll see autonomy grow in different environments so that the end where you've got one that can transit every environment is still you know, a decade, two decades away. Yeah, because they were saying that it's, it's ideal that when they're like from Adelaide, if we end up with two terminals or three terminals from at airports from terminal to terminal, then you start to think yourself, well, actually, two autonomous vehicles put together as a train. Yeah. Uh, why don't you have a train going from Terminal 1 to 2 and have more people? So it's interesting where the niche actually is, yeah. but I think in a country like Australia where we've got long distances, you can go across the Nullarbor, you can have a, have a good time. Well, the reality is that, that um, what autonomous vehicles most of the time will only connect you to another part of the transport network. Yeah. Uh, we've had discussions with Adelaide Airport about shuttles for the long-term car park. Yeah. It's kind of a no-brainer. You know, that's, it's a known route and all that sort of stuff, and they've got it's a significant cost to do that now. It's about getting, uh, waiting for the cost of some of these things to come down. The, the clubs have also been looking to take your analogy about mobile phones, that currently we're fixated, not fixated, but most people think of, of, of mobility as having an asset in your driveway, so that you're in control of your destiny. We're looking at where you'll buy mobility like you buy a telephone plan. You might pay hundred dollars a month to have a five minute plan that is when i put in a request to go from here to there within five minutes a solution of some shot type will show up that's why uber are in this space because they want to see themselves as that so if i need to go from here to uh, uh adelaide uni i am probably not going to go in an autonomous vehicle an autonomous vehicle will pick me up here it'll have me integrated into the train schedule i will get off with electronic ticket on and at the other end something else will be there to take me to Adelaide Uni and that's what people, the sh mind shift goes from owning the asset will give you there to giving the mobility problem to a service provider who delivers it. Can I bring the subject back to the copper strategy of our yeah. um, As most people know, uh, copper deposits in South Australia are quite deep and some of this uh, copper occurrences, particularly say at the Olympic Dam and at Karapatina, are too deep for uh, conventional mining methods. So our company has developed a concept of in situ leaching. And you know, it's very favorable because when you go deep, your temperature goes up probably around 80 to 100 <coughs> degrees centigrade. Your pressure is quite high. And so it's and with the uh, advances in uh, fracturing, uh, this process becomes probably the only suitable method to extract uh, uh, copper from deep, uh, deep areas. For example, at Karapatina, Os Minerals drilled the hole uh, 2,500 meters deep. Of course, the first 500 is waste, waste rock, but the 2,000 meters was all copper ore averaging 2% and still ended in ore. So when you go below 1,500 meters, the temperature is so high 
pressure is so great that it's very difficult to mine it. And yet it's ideal for in situ leaching. So, so Rudy, am I right? You found carapetine, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So Rudy's got some deep history in, uh, in copper. We, we, we know that. So the question that I would like to divert that to was, so we talked about going from about 300,000 tonnes at the moment to a million tonnes in copper. So how do we, how do we find all of those non, um, um, I suppose, un unfound, undiscovered deposits, and then bring that sort of technology, what, whatever the technology might be, to get maximum extraction? Because they're going to be new, new types of uh, deposits, very deep, and um, and that sort of stuff. So I guess the question is, from the state, Charles, you know, the strategy is to support exploration. I guess. Yep. Uh, can you comment about that and I suppose link that into Rudy's comment about maybe the introduction of different technologies into, do we have a, a, a strategy in South Australia to, to introduce other technologies? How we expect that technology to be introduced into producing a million tonnes of copper? So it's a really um, good, good framework into the strategy which looks at that encouraging research. So just behind Rudy is Rudy, is uh, um, the um, uh, Robinson, sorry. Dave Robinson. That's, um, Dave Robinson from SAR is doing a whole lot of work with the, the um, uh, leaching, um, in situ leaching, and there's a whole program around that. So as part of the strategy, we're interested in that and how we can encourage that through the process. We are looking at a technology and research hub here to, to work out what are the new technologies that we can use. And so you've got the conventional mining, so you've got the Olympic Dam is still sort of working through their major ore body and in fact uh, the quote before about it being 200 years still to go just in conventional mining uh, will, will help. So we're looking at how we can support all those those parts of, of the technology area. Um, there are challenges with, with leaching, that's one of the things that's being explored and uh, I think the oil and gas uh, sector is, is experiencing some of those areas. Uh, and also how do we then extract the, the materials later on. Paul did you speak on the um, comment as well? Leaching is one of those uh, things that um, has, a, has, a, it has an empirical behaviour. Uh, you often have to trial it um, over a long period of time to get the right formula you know, in the right pattern, uh, the right pressure, uh, and um, it really requires piloting, um, fr from my experience anyway, uh, it requires piloting a particular formula uh, to see what works. Um, so things like the Mining and Petroleum Services Centre of Excellence is a, uh, you know, a platform where technology providers can come and partner with resource companies. And if the resources, resource companies are interested in piloting the technology, we're very happy to, to, uh, to, to put you in front of them and for you to, uh, uh, for you to uh, I guess, propose how you might pilot that technology. At the end of the day, uh, it's up to the resource companies or the tier ones that are the service providers to want to take the plunge. And so this whole question of innovation really is a question about how far along the adoption curve you are um, you know, with the technology you have and whether it's ready for someone to actually trial or not. And, and that boils down to the risk. So um, having Having a, a, a leaching technology to trial is one thing. Having it ready for the miners that exist in South Australia is another thing. Um, uh, but certainly there are forums within government that allow you to at least put that forward and, um, and see if the companies are interested in, in piloting or trialling it on their existing sites. I do think leaching is a, a very important part of our future for copper though and yep. there, are, there are a number of people working on leaching because it opens up smaller deposits. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Christine, you have a comment? Well I do because I think in situ leaching is the classic example of needing to get all the bits lined up. Um, and so yes, there is an innovative commercial, you know, testing app side but if you don't have the regulatory framework right, yep, if you don't manage the, com the discussion and the the kind of community views of it and you know kind of I love your aside about oil and gas having a few issues I mean you know it's, it has not created a great framework for ever, having any anything that you actually have to put fracking in a sentence is yeah. going to be a very difficult conversation yeah. so I kind of think like the nuclear debate 
Well, I know people, you know, I've had people say to me they're underwhelmed a bit by where the Royal Commission got. I think it's a huge advance even to be having a conversation. I just think it's a massive, massive step forward. And we need a similar conversation for the copper strategy now about positioning what people think of it because you're touching fundamental fears about potable water, about long-term environmental damage, about not being able to put your hand on your heart and say we truly understand because, I mean, you don't. I mean, a lot of this... But the reality is it hasn't stopped people concreting over arable land or doing a whole bunch of other stuff. It's just, it is at the moment set in a very emotive it is, um, environment. So I think for me, looking at the copper strategy, um, it, it's that frustration of how do you get all the bits moving together rather than waiting to have the answer and then work out how you sell it. Um, and I'm not sure that we've nailed that yet. I think that's one of the reasons why the conversations here today, as John said earlier, the, the conversation about these things is, some of the technical issues and some of the, the, the people yeah. side of things. Can I also just, just relate back, and I guess one of the things, this is about the, the future of work, and I guess what this is highlighting is that a number of years ago, fairly you know, traditional mining techniques and you know, use of you know, flotation, etc., which is well, but now we're expanding to a whole range of other technologies, and I think that highlights that for, from a future of work point of view, there's other skill sets that are needed, whether it be the community side of things, stakeholders, the technical, all the way through. And I think that's one of the opportunities that, that comes out of this. Yeah, I think I just w would want to go back uh, to, to Rudy's question, I guess, in terms of deep underground operations and how that might work in terms of a new a new model for extracting minerals. And I, I just list remember listening to Andrew Cole uh, talk about uh, how we would work underground and he was talking about a jumbo operator. And so, you know, the, old, the idea that we're going to actually get somebody and train them up as a... Um, an, uh, I, I suppose a, a person who's just going to operate autonomous machinery is different because actually jumbo no operators know what they're doing because of the material. They know what's good ground, they know how to, how to do it. So what they would rather do is take a jumbo operator and take them out and, and teach them how to, to operate the uh, autonomous machinery or the, the, the control machinery rather than taking somebody from the other direction. So, you know, a young kid who's, who's a great at, uh, at PS4 to, to <laughs> operate a jumbo. It's not the way it's going to work. So I guess that's, that's interesting because we're going to see people coming out of the mine. I think that's pretty clear. I think, I don't know, comments we'll about that, but yeah. people will come out of the mines and they'll be operating on the surface. They might have remote or autonomous systems. Um, but the more people we can get out of the mine, the safer and all of those sorts of things. So that, that's probably likely. So deep, deep underground in situ um, leaching could easily be a part of that, but operated from the surface, couldn't it? Well, it touches on keyhole mining, because, you know, I mean, from the other yeah. side of it, if you kind of it's look at what's word. actually happening, yeah. we're getting, yeah. we're able to mine lower and lower concentrations, which means a much higher waste ratio, yeah. which creates all of the issues. I mean, the issue is never with the ore about yeah. managing the environmental stuff. It's a waste. So, um, you know, this is actually part of the future of mining for it to be acceptable which is this notion that you can look across an, a landscape and not really know there's a mine there. Um, and so, but in, as soon as you say it, people kind of get scared about it, whereas I think it's actually part of the solution yeah. for the future. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, we've got time for one more question. I just wanted to say before we move on to that, the 3D theatre that we were going to talk about today and that we were going to give the opportunity to go through, unfortunately, because of the the spike in uh, electricity last night and the way that it resets and so on, it's not going to be uh, available. So, unfortunately, but I know there are also a number of people who registered to go on the tour of Tonsley. I'd be really interested uh, to see hands if anybody um, still wants to do that. We've, because got, Jed, we've got Jed here. Yeah, yeah, the Tonsley, yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's, there's a... Excellent. So there, there'll be uh, a number, and could you stand up for everybody to see? So we're going to meet after the presentation over here to, to do that. That's fantastic. Thank you. But sorry about the 3D theatre, but I'm sure we'll get something else to do it again next time. Absolutely. Uh, when we come down to the Drill Call Library. Um, interesting. I did hear the ETSA, oh, SA Power Network talking about last night, and they said it took 5.7 seconds, I think, for the for the whole state to go. Uh, dark, um, and now the dark state, dark startup uh, process 
will probably take something like five days. So, <laughs> so uh, anyway, so there we are. One more question, and well, sorry. Macaulay yeah. um, Coelho from Tape SA. Um, I'm from the electronics school. So currently, Tape SA is being very proactive about creating new qualifications to meet industry requirements. And so far, we've got associate degrees in electronics, biomedical, electrical, and a couple in civil. Um, there's been a lot of talk about internet <laughs> things and other new skill sets requirements. Where would you like educational institutions? And I suppose from my perspective, TAFE SA uh, and uh, from the geoscience department as well to get the right skills for where the future of work's going to be. Good question. <clears throat> I just, I guess a quick comment from me. Um, I guess from a Honeywell's perspective, I, I think collaboration with, with companies like Honeywell, with industry, I think, um, I think that's the thing that's missing. Um, I think uh, the the, uh, the collaboration they have here with the Santos and the, and the Beach, I think that's fantastic. Um, but I, I think collaboration with industry. Um, industries at the coalface, they know exactly the, the skill sets are needed. They know how they want, you know, the, the people coming in the industry to be taught, um, the levels they need to be taught at. Um, and I, my, um, I've had a bit of experience with TAFE here, with the, um, the PLC labs and stuff here. Um, and, and I worked very closely in my previous role with, with TAFE here. And th that worked out really well because we would help um, drive the, the content in those courses. And from time to time we would come down and teach advanced bits and pieces of, of some of that curriculum. So uh, I guess collaboration with, with us, with the industry. I think the challenge is that, I mean, businesses are always going to be driven by the point of time they're at, even if the conversation is around future proofing. And I think there's a different question for what businesses need from what your graduates need. Because at the end of the day, for someone moving out, they might meet a business's need for a period of time, but they have to have flexibility, a capacity to be skilled in more than one area. And so I, I tend to really, really encourage people to think of you know, if you, if whatever your field is, you can have a second string to your bow, mm -hmm. which one de demonstrates you kind of think more broadly and deal with this fact that, you know, some of the skills are much more like university courses are structured, which is we teach you how to think rather than just a defined body of work. And I think that crossover is right across the education sector now. It's no longer you've got technical education and somehow you know, kind of tertiary that needs to operate Which is why TAFE is moving yeah. into a higher education space. Yeah. I think the other, other area that really mm. needs to have some focus is that if you look at automation and remote operations, that's been a fairly good transition right. uh, and the miners have done very well there. But when it comes to maintenance, it's a whole different ballgame. You look at Rio Tinto's Brisbane Process Centre, they claim $100 million in saving, eventually they're shutting it down. And it's, it's a total write-off. The problem there is the maintenance people at site do not understand data analytics. It's a completely different, exactly. you, you're talking a completely different uh, terminology to them. So uh, the type of people that, that we want, and then what Paul Goak has mentioned with Santos as well, is that you need that ground level ex experience. Sometimes it's not, it's basically hands-on experience. And I think TAFE can play a big role there where you provide that hands-on experience because you need to communicate the results of your data analytics to those people. If you don't do that, but they don't implement the results of of, of your analytics. It's a total waste of effort. and that's what Rio Tinto has. So would that mean multidisciplinary type yeah. qualifications, which yeah. have both the so. say electronics slash big data processing, yeah. as well as a deep understanding yeah. of uh, geoscience, even mechanical engineering, mechanical, engineering. Yeah. mechanical fitters? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, they are the guys who are going to implement whatever recommendation you come up with. If it doesn't get implemented, <coughs> and they become the most employable. Yeah. Yeah. So Christine's comment uh, is supported by a lot of research at the moment which talks about adaptive capacity, yeah. uh, about plugging in new skill sets and how you do that. And I was with the Training and Skills Commission this week and Santos and a number of other big employers who say actually it's not about, it's not about qualifications anymore, particularly now, but it's not about qualifications anymore. It's actually about what are the extra things. So the qualifications are baseline. You know, it's what's the extra thing that somebody brings. So thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your time this morning. It's been fantastic. I just want to touch on a couple of uh, things. One, one is 
In terms of the SME supply chain, we're understanding that, that we need to change our mentality about that. We've got a function coming up um, in November the 3rd, which talks about from order taker to solution maker and thinking about a more innovative SMEs, and you, of course, you're welcome. And I just want to uh, mention about the mining engineering. I think um, Charles mentioned that I said it was zero. So Adelaide University started mining engineering in 2009, took in 90 uh, students. This year it's zero, no mining engineering. And we're working on a program at the moment with Adelaide University to assist those who have completed their coursework going back from 2013, 14 and 15, who haven't yet been able to graduate because they haven't completed their work experience requirements. So they're not being able to get a professional qualification. So what we're trying to do is link them up to businesses, companies, where they can be under the supervision of a mining engineer for a period of work experience. The great thing is that they can really add value to businesses. They are basically uh, at no cost. There's no, no wages cost. The insurances and everything else are covered by the university. And it's a great opportunity for them to bring some fresh ideas and updated modern thinking to, to businesses. So if you have a mining engineer and you've got work to be done, you should be actually considering bringing in one of these um, I was going to say graduates, so not, not quite graduates, so, uh, on mining engineering into your business. And, and we would look, um, you know, if you wanted to talk about it, you could either speak to me or there's Janine Carruthers at the back and, uh, and Gail's back there. I just there want to say, yeah, so UDSA has a new course, Engineering and Internship Research Project, which is a, uh, the alternative to the final year project. And it is free and it is covered by the insurance. So. It's not where you've got to wait to traditionally like over the summer, it, it is through the year. Yep. Embedded in their program, very flexible, can be part time, full time, um, and that's across the disciplines of engineering. So anybody who needs um, yep. some fresh mind and uh, support it academically. So, so particularly uh, because we're coming up into the summer period where we get third and fourth years who are available to do that work, we'd, um, we'd love to talk to you. Or you could go to the you can't see the address there, but there is a website called Hot Rubble, hotrubble.com.au, uh, which is a, an industry website, and there is a link there to mining engineering. So if you could go to that we'd, uh, and have a look, we'd, we'd appreciate it. So thank you very much. appreciate your time. Those people, I'm sorry, I missed your name? Jed. Jed. Those people who want to go on the Tonsley tour, Jed is over here, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Good morning.